right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Um, my name is Ryo Takehara. Um, I'm the deputy director at the Japan Foundation of Los Angeles. And um, um, this um, tonight's event is hosted by JFLA, Japan Foundation of Los Angeles, and the uh, uh, Journal TO, um, um, Japanese uh, National Tourism Organization. So before we, we get to um, the lecture start, uh, we'd like a uh, we'd like to ask a few words from uh, JFLA and the German TO. So, um, Director uh, Ms. Uchida from uh, JFLA, would you please? Good evening. Nice to see you all here. My name is Yasuko Uchida, and I am Director of the Japan Foundation Los Angeles. Japan Foundation was established in 1972 as an organization dedicated to carrying out comprehensive international cultural exchange programs throughout the world. Our headquarters is in Tokyo and we have 25 overseas offices in 24 countries, including our Los Angeles and New York offices in the US. Next year, we will celebrate our 50th anniversary Japan Foundation Los Angeles opened its door in 1983 in Little Tokyo. In 2012, we moved to Mid Wilshire, Miracle Mile District. We support Japanese language education all over the US and, and presents arts and cultural exchange programs. Since last year, all of our events are whole, held online. Today's virtual lecture is a two-part series with the second one scheduled for February 25. It is a great pleasure to present this lecture series focusing on Buddhist deity sculptures at Buddhist temples in Kyoto and Nara. This lecture is also a collaboration with the Japan National Tourism Organization, JNTO. Therefore, we will also be suggesting unique and interesting tourism experiences that can be found near each temple. Today, lecture will focus on Kyoto and I would like to welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Michael Van. Michael-san, imasuka? Are you, please raise your hand. Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. And uh, he, he was a former research scholar of Japanese art at LACMA. He also presented several lectures and curated exhibitions for JFLA. This time, he will talk about Buddhist de deity sculptures at four famous temples in Kyoto. Subsequently, Miss Kay Allen, Kay san from JMTO, Los Angeles we we'll introduce interesting places and delicious foods and sweets where you must enjoy. When the COVID-19 epidemic eventually calms down and international travel resumes, you may have a chance to visit Japan. Until then, please remember today's lecture and enjoy Japan through open eyes. It is indeed a rare opportunity for you to have a deep insight into the ways how to really appreciate Buddhist sculptures, as well as to know the useful and practical information about the travel to Japan. So that's all from, from me now. Thank you very much. Right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Uchida-san. Right, so um, uh, Shoj, uh, Executive Director Shoj uh, from Gentil, uh, would you give us a few words too? Yeah, sure. So hello everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar, hosted by Japan Foundation and Japan National Tourism Organization. My name is Kaoru Shoji, and I'm, I'm the Executive Director of Gentil Los Angeles. So Kyoto and Nara, which will be introduced in this webinar series, are important centers of Japanese culture and are special places even for Japanese people. So I hope that today's webinar will deepen your understanding of Japanese culture. Of course, 
The best way to experience Japanese culture is to visit Japan for yourself. Although travel is currently not possible, we hope that this virtual trip to Japan will inspire and excite you to one day visit once COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. So we look forward to welcoming you all. But until then, please enjoy today's 90 minutes trip to Japan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we're going to have our one hour lecture and um, uh, 30 minutes Q&A after that. Uh, so if you have questions about the presentation, uh, you can always go hit the Q&A uh, down below and um, you can leave a comment or whatever. All right. So um, I'd like to hand it over to Michael Sun. Are you ready? Oh, yeah, I'm absolutely ready. I hope everybody else is ready too. Um, I'm going to talk as uh, slowly as possible, but um, I do tend to speak quickly when I get excited about something. So I do hope that you'll ask lots of questions. And uh, just to remind everyone, you can ask questions through the question and answer function at the bottom of the Zoom uh, screen. Um, you can, uh, these are questions that we will hopefully deal with at the end of the session as well. Uh, and if you're ready, then we will get started. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see what we're going to talk about. So those of you who are new to us today, uh, I did a series of lectures for the Japan Foundation a little bit earlier during the summer in 2020. We discussed uh, how to identify deities, how to look at them, looking at their clothing, looking at their gestures, looking at many, many different features of these sculptures, and we learned how to identify them. Uh, and you can wa watch each of those episodes on YouTube uh, through a link that will be provided later on, and you'll be able to learn more about the different classes of deity. So some of the key terms that you'll hear me use in the presentation today, I just want to go over them again. Uh, so butsu and yorai, uh, those are words that I might use. Uh, they are both are in, they're indicators for a Buddha, um, so for a figure that uh, is probably at the upper tier of the Buddhist deities. Bosatsu, um, and you'll hear me use names like Kanon or Seishi, uh, these are indicators for a Bodhisattva. So a being who has achieved enlightenment, but who has graciously delayed their exit from the cycle of rebirth. Um, or they've delayed their achievement of Buddhahood so that they can help other living beings achieve enlightenment for themselves. Um, yo -o, and you'll hear me say names like Fudo or Daitoku. Um, these are indicators for a wisdom king. So myo -o means wisdom king. Uh, ten, uh, and these are, they are, they'll hear them at the name, at the ends of the names of celestial beings. So these are beings that have been adopted into the Japanese pantheon and who largely come from Vedic sources. So from um, Indian religions, um, there are some from uh, China as well, and they were adopted into Japan. Uh, you'll hear me use the word Rakan, and a Rakan is a disciple of the Buddha. That's the easiest, um, easiest definition. There's obviously a lot more nuance to what a Rakan is, but I think the easiest way to remember what they are is that they are a disciple of the Buddha. Uh, Kaisan. Uh, the Kaisan is the founder of a temple. And a Kaisan, you'll, I'll, I'll be introducing a few of the different Kaisan. Now, just to kind of look back at the lecture series that I did before, I just want to remind some of you how to identify a deity. So first, you're going to be looking at the physical appearance. Uh, you'll be looking at the hairstyle. Uh, you will be looking at the facial features. Uh, you'll be looking at the number of arms and the number of legs. So, you know, there's going to be groups of deity where they have more than two arms. They have more than two legs. Uh, the posture that they're sitting in, some will have a more active, violent posture, while others will be more serene and sitting back. You'll look at the gestures. So the positions of the arms, as we see here, and the mudras that they form with their hands. Implements. Some of them will be carrying tools of worship. Others will be carrying weapons. Some of them might have a jar in their hand or some identi identify identifying feature that they hold in their hands. And then finally, their clothing. So some might appear in simple robes, kind of like a monk's robes. Some might have princely clothing. 
So wearing crowns and wearing uh, princely finery. Some might have magisterial garb, so clothing that you might see on court courtiers or um, aristocrats. And then some are even wearing like martial armor. So armor that is worn by warriors. So then the purpose of this specific series is to highlight deities in a temple context. You will be going to lots of museums, you'll be going to lots of uh, cultural institutions, and you might see paintings or you might see sculptures of these deities there. Uh, but there they are often for viewing. Whereas when you go into a temple, there's actually a function to them. They're actually being used in practice, whether that's daily, whether that's weekly, whether that's annually, uh, they are being used still on these temple complexes. And so to that end, I'm going to be looking at a very, very brief abbreviated history of these temples. And I'll be looking at a few, very few key figures for each of these temples as well. Uh, we'll look briefly at the layout and we'll look briefly at the notable sculptures that you can see there. Now, I do wanna make a couple notes about this presentation. The first is that this is very introductory. Uh, there's obviously going to be a whole lot more about these sculptures, a whole lot more about these temples, a whole lot more about the architecture on the precincts that we were looking at. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm very, I'm giving you a very, very brief, I'm, I'm trying to cover four temples in 30 minutes and I can only do a very, very rudimentary, I can only do a very, very rudimentary introduction to these temples. So if you have further questions, you can feel free to contact me. I'm happy to answer more questions by way of email. Uh, there's gonna be no discussion of religious precepts, uh, doctrine and uh, sutra translations. That's not something that I think we have time to cover. So I'm going to be, again, very introductory. I would say also that this is designed to supplement the Who's Who series. I won't be looking at the deities through the eyes to help you identify them. Instead, I'm going to assume that you will be watching the Who's Who series either later on, or you have already watched them, and you will be able to look at the details to be able to identify the deities. Rather, I will be talking about how the deities fit into the buildings that they are shown in or the complexes that they are on. And finally, I'll be talking about the, um, uh, just a little note about the accessibility of these featured sculptures. Some of them will be hidden from view. Some of them you won't be able to access at certain times. So I, you will have to do your own personal research to find out which ones are accessible when you will be in Japan. I'm saying when, not if, because I know all of you will get there at some point. So now looking inside the temple. So in a temple complex, uh, you are, Overall, the whole precinct is going to be called, it's often referred to as Ji, Dera, or In at the end of the name. So we are looking at Byodo In, we are looking at uh, Chion In, we are looking at To Ji, uh, there are other temples called Hase Dera. Uh, so you can hear, if you see the Ji, if you see the Dera, if you see the In, or you hear them, you will know that it's a Buddhist temple. Then there's going to be buildings that appear within the pre precinct of a temple. Uh, and these are often identified by the phrase do at the end, or these, this little suffix do. And you might have a building called hondo, which is sort of the main hall. Kondo, which is the golden hall. Godai do, which is the, a hall built for the godai myo. Shaka do, which is a hall built for shaka. Um, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha. So these are purpose-built halls. Now, that's not to say that they all end in Do. You also have something called the Kyozo, which is the sutra repository. So most of the buildings will end in Do, but not all of them. Another phrase I want to introduce to you, or another word I want to introduce to you, is Daiza. And that's a pedestal for a Buddhist image. And what's really cool about a Daiza is that by looking at the platform that it is sitting on, the pedestal that it is sitting on, you can often figure out the date, you can often figure out the type of deity it is. And these are all hints that add to the ability to identify who the deity is and when it was made. 
Now, sometimes the Daiza is not original to the sculpture, but if it is, it gives you a really good, clear indication. The term Honzon means a principal image. So this is the central image in a certain building. It can also mean the central image for an entire complex, but it can also mean the central image in a grouping of deities as well. So Honzon is a very multifunctional word. Hibutsu, and this is one that I really want to highlight. A Hibutsu or hidden Buddha is a Buddha that is hidden away from public view. Uh, you might see it in articles described as a hidden Buddha, but it's not just a Buddha. It can also be a Bodhisattva. It can also be a wisdom king. It can also be a celestial being. Um, but the generic term for that is a hidden Buddha. Now, these can be revealed once a year. They can be re revealed once every few years. Uh, they can be revealed once every few decades, or they might not be revealed to the public at all. So that is going to take some research on your part as well. And then something to note as well, if you want to figure out more how to identify the deity as well, you can look at the building interior. Uh, it can provide context on how to identify the deity. So you look at the wall or the partition paintings, if there are some. Um, so for example, we'll be looking at the Biodoin later, and I will be talking very briefly about the wall paintings and how they work into uh, situating the sculpture that's at the center. And then looking at hanging scrolls as well. Uh, hanging scrolls will help you identify what is going on with these sculptures in the area too, in some cases, and in other cases they might be a completely separate grouping. So the first temple that we'll be looking at is Toji. So Toji uh, is in Kyoto, uh, and it is an extremely important temple. Uh, it, wa it was also called uh, Kyo Ohoko Kokuji. Uh, it's a temple that was designated, established in 796, under the auspices of Emperor Saga. Now, Emperor Saga, he was a very important patron of Shingon Buddhism. Uh, Shingon, Shingon Buddhism was, is an esoteric form of Buddhism, brought into Japan during the early 9th century by a very important figure named Kukai. Now, we are looking specifically at this building right here, indicated by the red arrow. Uh, and you can see where it is located inside this temple is almost at the center of the precinct. So this building is called the lecture hall. It is called the Kodo. And this was constructed in 835. And it is based on plans, ideas, doctrinal ideas of Kukai, who I introduced before. Now, something really cool about these buildings, about these halls that you see these sculptures in, sometimes they are built for the purpose of housing a sculpture that already exists. Sometimes they are built and a sculpture is commissioned to fill that space. And then sometimes the building and the sculptures are planned together and they are built together and they are completed together as well. Now, in this case, Kukai, uh, who was very important to Shingon doctrine in Japan, he had the idea to construct a lecture hall. And he wanted in this lecture hall to be created something called a sculptural mandala. Now, many of you might know mandaras uh, or mandalas as these ge ge uh, geographic representations, two-dimensional geographic representations of sacred places or sacred spaces. And Kukai had the great idea of turning it into three dimensions. He wanted to make it sculptural. And he wanted to base this sculptural mandala on the Sutra of Humane Kings, which is a sutra all about the protection of the nation as long as the ruler, the emperor, is adhering to Buddhist doctrine. Again, that's a very simplified way to define the Sutra of Humane Kings, but I think it captures the essence of what's going on here. So Kukai, he designed this lecture hall, and he designed, he chose the sculptures that would be shown in the building as well. 
And so these sculptures were completed around 839, and there are some later replacements because some have been lost or damaged. So this is the, it's, for me, it's probably one of the most impressive uh, displays of sculpture in all of Kyoto. I absolutely love this temple. Uh, here we see sort of a layout of what to expect. At the very center, uh, you've got the primordial Buddha, um, you've got the cosmic Buddha, Dainichi Nyorai, and then you have four other Buddhas placed around him. To his right, to Dainichi Nyorai's, on his left side, to the right when we walk into the building, to the, his right, you see a grouping of five great bodhisattvas. To his right, to our left, you will see the five great wisdom kings. And then you will see on either side that there are going to be celestial beings as well. So in total, there are 21 different sculptures. Now, if you're very curious about who some of these figures are, they actually give us an indication as to the direction that is intended for these figures. So Tamonten, he's a protector of the north. So all the deities, so number 14, number four, number nine, they are all protectors of the north, or they, all, they are all associated with the north. Uh, Jikokuten, he's associated with the east. So number 15, number five, number 10, they are all associated with the eastern direction. Zochoten is, uh, Zochoten is associated with the south, and so number seven, number two, and number 12 are associated with the southern direction. And if you look back at the Who's Who series I did, you will see that I sometimes mention directional guardians. This will help you identify the figures by knowing which way is north, which way is east, which way is south. And then in West Komokuten, for example, number three, number eight, and number 13 are all going to be associated with the western direction. Uh, just for the people who know who Amida is, Amida would be number three. These are figures that I think are representative. They are all at the center of each. So Dainichi, we've got Dainichi Nyorai, who is at the center of the Buddhas, the five Buddhas. We have Kongo Haramitsu Bosatsu, uh, who is at the center of the five great bodhisattvas. We have Fudo Myo, who is at the center of the five great wisdom kings. And we have Taishakuten. And Taishakuten is a little bit strange because even though he is chief of the celestial beings, he's over here at the far left. Bonten is his counterpart because when you talk about Taishakuten and Bonten, we are also referring to Indra and Brahma, who are Vedic deities. And they are chief deities in Vedism, but they are subservient deities in Buddhism. They have been adopted to and they serve the Buddhas, they serve the Bodhisattvas, they serve the wisdom kings, and they serve to protect them. So all of these sculptures were created in the 9th century, 839. We've got a very specific date for that because of records. Uh, looking at these sculptures is just absolutely gorgeous. I think these mandorlas that are behind them are just absolutely ornate, absolutely beautiful. And I think they represent very much the characters of the figures as well. The wisdom kings especially are associated with fire. And so this mandorla behind Furo Myo is all looks like flame. Dainichi Nyorai, you can see it, maybe just barely, but you can see that there are lots of other figures incorporated into the mandorla here. And they are all emanations from <clears throat> the Buddha who is at the center of the universe. Next temple I want to talk about is Byodoin. So Byodoin is located in Uji. Now Uji, a long time ago, um, was filled with wealthy estates. It's where a lot of aristocrats and a lot of nobility would have had either escape, like um, royal escapes, uh, where they could escape from the hustle and bustle of the busy city, 
um, they would often have villas there. And Byodo-in was originally a villa for the Fujiwara clan. And the Fujiwara, um, if you're not familiar, was a very, very powerful family. Uh, I, I, I almost want to call them a dynasty. Um, but they are a very, very prominent clan who had a lot of sway over what was going on in Japan during these different periods. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of influence. They married off... Uh, their sons and daughters to imperial um, family members or to uh, other aristocratic families to be able to ensure that the influence that they had would not lessen. Now, one of the uh, influential figures from the Fujiwara clan um, that is instrumental in establishing Byodoin was Fujiwara no Yorimichi. Uh, he established Byodoin in 1052, and it was originally intended for private use, so only for the family. And that meant that you weren't going to have uh, commoners, you weren't going to have the common folk walking onto this area. This is a place where you could relax, rejuvenate, but also engage in private worship. Now, rebirth in the Western Pure Land was very important uh, for a lot of figures, uh, for a lot of people. They wanted to ensure that they would gain Amida's favor. And to be able to do that, they would build merit by creating large complexes like this and devoting them to the worship of Amida and devoting it to Pure Land Buddhism as well. Now, a very important building on Byodoin precinct is the Phoenix Hall, uh, the Ho'odo. Now, it's called the Ho'odo um, because if you look at it from above, it sort of looks like a bird with its wings outstretched and its tail out behind it. It also has these phoenix, uh, these phoenix figures up on the roof as well. Now, the Ami, it's also called an Amidado, and it's called an Amidado, so if you remember when I talk about Do, it's very purpose-built. And so this was purposely built to have an Amida sculpture in it. Now, this picture down at the bottom left, it's a little bit far away, but you can see a little bit of a face peeking through this circular window. Now, this on the right, you can actually see the face is designed to look straight through. Uh, and that's if you are walking around the property, if you are walking on the other side of this lake, if you look across, you can see, you can look directly into the face of Amida. So this was constructed in 1053. And a very important sculptor that was involved in this process was a sculptor named Jocho. Uh, we don't know uh, his exact dates, but we do know he died around 1057. Uh, he made this massive sculpture of Amida Nyorai, uh, Amida Buddha, and he completed it in 1053. So roughly around the same time that the building was completed. So this building was purpose built to hold this sculpture. Now, this sculpture is considered an archetype of late Heian period sculpture. And you can tell by looking at the shoulders, by looking at the way that the clothing is depicted, even looking at the Daiza, you can tell that this is a Heian period sculpture. Uh, it's a seated Amida. Uh, he is forming with his hands the Amida Join. But there are also some really beautiful, really incredible pieces to look at in this hall. For example, the canopy over the head and the painted panels around. Now, you remember when I was talking about the Hekiga, the uh, wall paintings, these painted panels all represent, all, are all representations of the Western Pure Land. So where Amida Nyorai resides, these paintings create a larger vision of that Western Pure Land. Then looking at the little sculptures up around him here, they are a mixture of celestial bodhisattvas, of celestial musicians, and monks. And the celestial musicians, you can see that this one here is holding a drum. 
uh, the celestial bodhisattva is forming what is called the Gasho Mudra. So a mudra of respect, as is this monk here. And so these figures are all mixed together and they are all sitting on clouds. There's this cloud motif and it looks like these clouds are moving. So very, very interesting pieces here. Even here, it looks like you are, looks like this monk is coming down towards us. The way that the uh, wood is angled, the carving is angled, it looks like it's coming down towards us. These were all completed at the same time as the Amida, Amida and Yorai sculpture. If you want to see some more incredible pieces that uh, belong to this temple, you can go into the Hoshokan. The Hoshokan uh, is the museum on Byodoin's precinct. And the reason they made a museum is so that they could keep a lot of these artworks in stabilized environments. Uh, if they are on display in a hall, they're not exactly going to be kept in a climate controlled space. Uh, the sculptures are going to be, there's going to be the elements, there's going to be humidity, there's going to be dust, there's going to be dirt. Uh, even human beings going into these spaces their breath might um, cause an accumulation of certain um, particles, and you don't want that to happen. Uh, dust coming in when people walk into a hall, uh, those are all things that can affect these pieces. And so some of these have been put into the Hoshokan for longevity, and you can still see them. On the right here, we have another sculpture. It's from the 12th century at Byodoin, and it's the Juichi Men Kanon which is the 11-headed kanon, and this one was made during the Heian period. Another temple that I'd like to look at is Chionin. Uh, Chionin was, it's very important to the, the founder of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan. So Pure Land Buddhism has a much longer history than, uh, what, than, than it has been in Japan. Um, but Honen was instrumental in turning these ideas and propagating them to the uh, general public, to the commoners, to the elite as well. So he taught on this site beginning in 1175, but these were all rudimentary structures that were uh, built there. And they weren't intended for any sort of like long-term presence. And so a construction project was taken over by Genchi, um, who lived from 1183 to 1238, and he made sure a lot of the buildings on the precinct were created. Now, Chionin is a headquarter temple for Pure Land or Jodoshu Buddhism. I want to say it's a headquarter temple because there are different schools of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan, and each of those will have a different headquarter temple. So I'm very deliberately using the word a headquarter temple because there are going to be other headquarter temples as well, specifically for Pure Land Buddhism. Three buildings that I'd really like to highlight in this lecture. The first would be the Sanmon, which is the gate that you see right here. The second is the Miedo, which is here pointed in the blue arrow. And the third is the Seishido, which is up here with the yellow arrow. So first is the main gate, the Sanmon. And this was rebuilt in 1621. So a lot of the buildings at Chionin were lost. They were damaged, um, whether by fire or other um, catastrophes, earthquakes. And so a lot of the buildings had to be rebuilt. So in 1621, the main gate was rebuilt by Tokugawa Hidetada. Um, he was the shogun from 1605 to 1623. Now, what is so special about this Sanmon is that it is a two-story gate. The bottom level, you can just walk through. Um, people can walk through there. But the top level is a holy space. It's a sacred space. And in that sacred space, you will find sculptures of Shakan Yorai, which is this figure here, and 16 Rakan. Um, and there's the word Rakan. So remember, I defined that very, very basically as a disciple of the Buddha. Um, so these 16 Rakan, uh, they accompany the sculpture of Shakan Yorai. 
And so here's Shaka in this picture at the bottom left. And then you can see the Rakan against the wall, against the wall over here. Now, I couldn't find an exact date for when these were created, but given the style that they are shown in, I have a very strong suspicion that they were made at the same time that the main gate was built. The next building was the Miedo, uh, the image hall. And this is the Jodo, it's the Pure Land version. It's the Jodo version of a Founders Hall. So it is a hall where you often find an image of the founder of the temple um, or even the founder of a specific Buddhist school. So this one was rebuilt in 1639 during the um, Shogun reign of Tokugawa Iemitsu. Uh, these are portrait images of Honen. So there is a portrait image of Honen in the Miedo, but it is so incredibly hard to find a picture of it that I don't think it is accessible to the general public. So rather, I want to highlight a couple other images that you might find in the image hall, in the Miedo. So the first would be Amida Nyorai standing here, and then this also this standing image of Zendo Daishi. Now, Zendo Daishi is a very important figure in Pure Land Buddhism. He was a Chinese teacher known as Shan Dao, and he lived during the seventh century. Now, the relationship between Amida and Shan Dao, excuse me, uh, is, so Honen, he believed that Zendo Daishi, that Shan Dao was a earthly incarnation of Amida. And that's going to be important when we look at the next slide, when we look at the Seishido. So there is this relationship between Shan Dao or Zendo and Amida, because Zendo is the earthly incarnation of Amida. And so there's this association of a Buddha with a human who is walking the earth and propagating teachings. Both of these sculptures were created in the early Kamakura period, uh, in 1212, or and then the Zendo Daishi from 1225 to 1232. In the Seishi Hall, in the Seishi Do, there is a sculpture of Seishi Bosatsu. Um, the Seishi Hall was originally Honen's meditation chamber. Um, up until the early 13th century. Uh, then it was damaged, and then it was rebuilt in 1530. And this sculpture was made in 1234. Uh, it, it's representative of a Seishi Honen relationship. So the other name for the Seishi Do is the Honji Do, and Honji means original form, original ground, original form. And so Seishi was believed to be the original form, the original ground of Honen. So Honen, who was, you can argue, a student of Shan Dao, and Shan Dao was an incarnation of Amida, then Seishi, who is a attendant bodhisattva to Amida. You've got Honen, who represents Seishi. And so you've got this lineage of Pure Land lineage of the master and the Buddha with the student, with the disciple, separated by a few generations and the Bodhisattva. So I think that's just a really cool connection there. The last temple that I'd like to look at is the Shogoin. And the Shogoin is a temple that it was formerly known as the Jokuin, and the Jokuin was founded by Enchin, and Enchin was a very important figure in Tendai Buddhism, which is another esoteric school. Enchin was active during the 9th century. He founded the temple Jokuin, and very, very closely with Tendai, there arose a mountain asceticism called Shugendo. Uh, Shugendo, uh, it is often, you will find figures known as mountain ascetics or yamabushi that are very closely involved. And it's this combination of like mysticism and esoteric Buddhism 
and it's it's just a it's it's synchrony it's a syncretism it's got a lot of different ideas that pulls from a lot of different sources so the shoguin was reestablished or the jokuin i should say was reestablished in 1090 by zoyo um, as the shoguin and it became a headquarter temple for shugendo specifically for shugendo that is associated with tendai uh, there is also shugendo that is associated with shingon but that is a different branch than what we have here in the Shogoin. Now, one of the sculptures that you can see at Shogoin is a portrait sculpture of Enchin. Now, Enchin was a founder of the Jimon Tendai lineage of Buddhism. Uh, so within Tendai, you've got different schools. Enchin was very, very closely involved with the Jimon. So it's known as the Temple Gate School of Tendai Buddhism. This is a portrait sculpture and it is an absolutely incredible piece because if you look at the eyes, there is an incorporation of what looks like a little bit of crystal so that there's this glitter in the eyes as well. So in this portrait sculpture, uh, which was created by Ryose in the mid 12th century, uh, you can see that Enchin is being portrayed in a very realistic fashion here. Another figure that you can see is Enno Gyoja, and Enno Gyoja is from the 7th century, he was active during that time, and he is a semi-mythical founder of Shugendo. Um, I say semi-mythical because there are a lot of, there are a lot of events that are associated with him that are magical, that are mystical, that are legendary, and even though that we do have written records of him, some of his exploits uh, more veer onto the mythos of building this character and no Kyoja. Uh, he is the prototype ascetic. He would have wandered around in the mountains and he is attended to by two demon attendants, uh, Zenki and Goki. Uh, this sculpture specifically was made in 1695 during the Edo period. And we know the name of the sculptor due to temple records. Uh, Dewa no Kami Masatsune, uh, who was active during the 17th to 18th centuries. Now, this is a figure that I think a lot of people will recognize. Um, I talk a lot about Fudo Myo. Uh, he's one of my favorite deities, personally. Uh, there is a, there are so many sculptures of Fudo Myo at Shogoin. And the reason for that is that Fudo Myo has become central to Shugendo practice. Uh, a lot of the sites and a lot of the rites and rituals that are used in Shugendo are things that are associated with Fudo Myo o as well. So things like a waterfall, things like a fire ritual, um, these are rites and sites that are associated with Fudo Myo o And he becomes a very central figure in Shugendo. And that's why you will find lots of figures of Fudo Myo o at this Shugendo headquarter temple. Two of these sculptures, they date to the late Heian period. So from 1000 to 1185. Uh, and the one in the middle, which is, you know, with, has these striking eyes, these bright yellow eyes that almost pierce your soul. It was made in the Muromachi period. Now, the final grouping of deities there that I would like to look at is these original Buddhist forms of Kumano Kami. So a lot of you might know Kami as the indigenous deities of Japan. Now, there is this idea of Honji Suijaku, which is original ground, local traces. And I think I can simplify that into something that means Indian deity, Japanese form. So... There are monks that were active in Japan and they decided that, oh, in order to create the syncretism between Shinto, uh, between Kami worship and Buddhism, uh, we can create these relationships between the original Buddhist deities and then we can suggest forms of Kami that they are associated with. And this is, something that is depicted in painting it's also depicted in sculpture and what we see here with these three figures yakshi nyorai senju kanon and amida nyorai what we see here are the original buddhist forms 
of kami that are specific to the Kamano region. So that is going to be it for my presentation. I will see you all again for the question and answer session. Okay, I hand it off to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I really learned a lot uh, as well. Uh, let me pull my screen up here for you all. All right. Hopefully we can get that all going. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, um, all of you for joining us. My name is Kay Allen and I'm a deputy manager for Japan National Tourism Organization's Los Angeles office. And uh, we are a informational resource uh, for uh, visitors to Japan uh, with tourism information uh, to help you plan and uh, make the most of your trips to Japan. And uh, Right now, I'm going to be giving you a little bit more destination information on Kyoto specifically and around the temples that were um, introduced by Michael. And I'm also going to give you some really fun suggestions for hands-on activities that you can do in uh, Kyoto while you're visiting. And then I'm going to follow that up with some Japan 101 information for people who may or may not have visited Japan uh, that is just practical information and, and should help you with future visits. Now I want to start off with just an update on the current situation. Um, as of this month, uh, border enforcement measures are still in place until further notice, and this extends to 150 plus countries, including the United States. There is a solely special entry being rolled out, um, but with that, there are also special uh, requirements, including negative test results uh, within 72 hours prior to departure, as well as arrival PCR testing and a two-week mandatory quarantine. Um, and with each visit, you will be required to uh, obtain a new visa. So um, for that, you can contact your lo local consulate general of Japan. And transiting through the airports in Japan is okay, but special conditions do apply. So do please contact your airline ahead of time to find out what those conditions are. And as always, you can stay updated and informed on the current situation with our JNTO COVID-19 advisory page on our website. Now, I just wanna start off with a little bit of access information. Uh, the majority of travelers from the United States are going to be uh, going through Tokyo, transiting through Tokyo, either uh, to the Haneda International Airport, which is uh, located near central Tokyo, or uh, Narita International, which is located just outside of Tokyo with easy access uh, to major hub stations like Tokyo Station, um, which is where you can catch the bullet train or Shinkansen. And this will take you from Tokyo to Kyoto in about two and a half hours. And of course, there's a variety of different things that you can see and experience while you're in Kyoto. Everything from 17 UNESCO World Heritage Sites to uh, literally thousands of temples and shrines, um, historic dis districts like uh, the Gion District where you can see geisha and beautiful natural um, areas like Sagano Bamboo Forest and Arashiyama. But I want to start off by uh, giving you a better idea on access information for the temples that were mentioned um, by Michael. And uh, this actually you could do um, in a day and it wouldn't uh, really take too terribly much time to get around as Kyoto is um, quite small um, compared to other uh, cities. But uh, as you can see here, um, I've kind of set our starting point as Kyoto Station, um, as this is a major transit hub. Um, and of course, it's going to vary depending on where you're actually staying in Kyoto, but this is a good starting off point for um, our purposes. And you would start off with Choji Temple, moving on to Chionin Temple, and then moving farther north to Shogoin. And uh, finally, you would venture southward towards the Uji area, which you can see off to the right hand side. Um, it's quite a bit further south than uh, Kyoto Station, so it's moved off to the side of the map so that you can see the whole picture together. And that's where you'll finish things off with Byodoin. 
And to give you an idea of what this access would look like, um, starting off in Kyoto Station, uh, you can actually take a 15 minute walk to Toji Temple. As you can see on the map, it's uh, quite close. And uh, once you've finished your visit at Toji Temple, you can walk back to Kyoto Station um, where you can find a bus stop. Um, specifically the Kyoto Ekimaya bus stop, uh, which just means in front of the station. And uh, here's where you can hop aboard the uh, Kyoto City bus or Shie bus um, number 206. Um, and this will take you about 20 to 25 minutes away to um, Shion Inmae bus stop. Um, and that's where you can hop off and take a quick five to seven minute walk to Chion In Temple. And once you've finished your visit there, um, you're going to, again, use the Kyoto City buses. These are, um, they come very frequently and they're uh, very good to use for traveling around Kyoto if you're not doing so by train or by subway. So this time you'll be boarding the 202. Um, there are a number of different buses that make different loops that can take you to these places, but um, for this one, I've selected 202. Um, and this will take you to Kumano Jinjamae stop. Um, it's only about a six minute bus ride, and uh, this is a really good place to stop as it's only about a three minute walk uh, to Shogoin Honzeki Temple. And uh, your final stop is going to be Byodoin, and as you can see on the map, um, it's quite a bit further away uh, from the other temples. So you'll want to get to a good um, transit hub uh, such as Tofukuji Station, and you can either go by taxi. Um, from Shogoin, uh, which is only about 10 to 15 minutes, obviously based on traffic. Uh, but you also have the option to use that same 202 Kyoto City bus from that Kumano Jinjamae stop. And that will also take you to Tofukuji Station in about 20 minutes or so. Um, from there, you'll use the Nara line um, and take that to Uji Station. And uh, that's about a 24 minute ride. And then it's only a uh, less than 10 minutes walk to Byodoin. Um, so just to give you an idea how that would look transit wise. Now I'd like to introduce a couple of interesting things that you can um, experience while you're visiting all of these temples. Uh, the first of which is going to be Nishiki Market. Um, this is kind of like Kyoto's Kitchen. It's a great market with lots of different food stalls where you can try um, lots of different regional dishes. Uh, and maybe it's a good place for you to stop off for your lunch. Um, and it's just across the river from Chion In. So uh, this is a good place to kind of uh, stop off and grab a bite. Another that we'd like to highlight is Gion Corner. This is a great place for um, enthusiasts of uh, traditional Japanese art forms, um, performance art specifically, um, things like uh, the Maiko dancing or Kyomai dance that is um, uh, specific to Kyoto. Uh, you can also see performances of Bundaku Puppet Theater, um, traditional court music performances, as well as a traditional flower arrangement or ikebana, and the tea ceremony as well uh, can also be seen performed here. And this is very easily accessible both in price and time-wise. Um, it's about an hour or so performance, um, and it showcases uh, six or seven different performance art forms. So this is a good opportunity for those who want to kind of get a whole bunch of different experiences in one place. Another great place to grab a bite to eat or maybe even a drink or, or some tea is Pontocho. Uh, this is a little um, kind of alley area where they have lots and lots of different um, shops and restaurants. Um, and it's just a cute, uh, fun vibe. It's sort of a, a very old meets new um, type of an area. So this might be a fun place for you to stop off and grab another bite to eat. And then our uh, last one was around Byodoin, uh, and this is the Ujigami Shrine. Um, and it's just across the river from Byodoin, so um, this will be a great place to stop off. Um, and there are also some other hands-on activities that I'll be introducing um, shortly that are located near the shrine. Um, so it'll be good to factor into your visit. Now, the first hands-on experience that I'd like to recommend is a visit to Taizoin Temple. Um, and this is a Zen Buddhist temple that is actually located inside of another temple, inside of a Nyoshinji Temple. And this is a bit further north, um, closer to Ninnoji Temple. 
And uh, there are a number of activities that you can participate in, uh, one of which being Zen meditation exercises or a Zazen, seated Zen meditation. And uh, the monk that actually leads these exercises was educated in the United States um, for his university education. So he does speak English quite well and uh, he's very friendly and talkative. And uh, so he leads these exercises in English. And he uh, also does uh, tours as well. Um, they have beautiful Zen garden in uh, Miyoshinji. And uh, so you can take a tour of the garden. And at the end of your stay, you can also enjoy a beautiful Shoujin Ryori lunch. And this is vegan food. Um, and it's an elevated version of the food that the monks uh, dine on. Um, and it's uh, incredibly delicious and completely free of animal byproducts. So uh, this is something that I challenge everyone to try at least once. Now around the Uji area, um, Uji actually has a very rich tea history. Um, so there are some very uh, fun things that you can do such as uh, taking a course where you can learn how to make matcha. Um, and uh, you can enjoy matcha and some uh, Japanese tea sweets. Um, and also you can uh, enjoy a pottery, um, pottery class while you're in the Uji area as well. Um, and they have some very distinctive pottery. So it's quite fun um, activity. And you also end up with a souvenir that you can take home with you as well. And then you can also visit, as I mentioned, Ujigami Shrine um, while you're in the area. Now I'd like to move on with just some Japan 101. Um, and there are quite a few appeals uh, to Japan as a destination. Um, and all of these I think are going to remain top of mind for travelers going forward. Uh, chiefly safety, cleanliness um, are going to be very important um, when selecting a destination for travel once restrictions are lifted. Uh, but Japan also has a real commitment to hospitality and comfort as well. Um, so it makes it a very ideal destination to travel to no matter um, if you're going solo or with family or multi-generational. Now there are uh, 19 uh, major international gateways throughout the United States that service nonstop flights to Japan, making it a very easily accessible destination. And these gateways extend not only to the um, very well-known Narita International and Haneda International airports, um, but also to Kansai International uh, as well, which is located in Osaka. And it's going to be the closest to uh, Kyoto and also Nara. Uh, so this is a, a good uh, destination. If you're coming from the West Coast, you do also have it as an option um, for flying from Los Angeles and San Francisco, etc. Now for transportation, there are a lot of opportunities to uh, save on uh, transportation when moving throughout the country, such as with the Japan Rail Pass, which is geared um, exclusively towards international visitors. Um, this gives you unlimited rides on JR line bullet trains, um, as well as limited express local trains, buses, and even a ferry, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but it's available in seven, 14, and 21 day durations. So depending upon the uh, length of your trip, you can select the pass that will be um, best for you. Uh, there are also, of course, ways to um, arrange for private transfers um, and rental cars also uh, with G English GPS navigation available if you are gonna be venturing out into those more rural areas where there aren't as many uh, public transit options. You also can use things like prepaid IC cards, such as the uh, Suica card, which gives you ease of use when moving through subways and uh, local trains. And it also uh, gives you um, the ability to make purchases in vending machines and in convenience stores without needing to um, fumble with change. So these are some good options for you. You also have the ability to upgrade um, your experience on the bullet train um, with things like the green car and the grand class. The green car is also available as a rail pass. Um, you can upgrade to green car uh, version of the pass and it's uh, much like a business class experience on the bullet train um, with the 2-2 seating that you see there, a little bit more spacious. Uh, the grand class is the sort of ultra exclusive um, uh, bullet train experience I did 
finally get to experience it myself for the first time and I am a little bit ruined uh, now for um, the other bullet train cars. Um, it has the 2-1 seating that you see there um, and also comes with butler service and complimentary um, food, drinks and alcohol. So it is a very luxurious experience, um, but it's only available on two lines uh, throughout the country. So the first of which being Tokyo to uh, Kanazawa, the Hokuriku line, and then also the Tohoku or Hokkaido bullet train line, which takes you from Tokyo to um, Japan's deep north and extending all the way into the most southern tip um, of Hokkaido in Hakodate. Now for Wi-Fi or mobile connectivity, a lot of people gravitate towards the travel sim, but we like to have them consider um, things such as whether their phone is unlocked or not. If they are on a lease program, um, their phone may be locked, which will make uh, using an alternate sim impossible. And also if they need to make uh, phone calls while in country. If not, then they might consider instead a pocket Wi-Fi. Um, this is a very uh, pocket-sized, uh, as in the name, uh, device that uh, gives you Wi-Fi connectivity, um, and it can support uh, usually up to 10 devices, making it really great and ideal for groups um, moving together through the country. Um, and there are also places where you can get uh, free Wi-Fi uh, in Japan as well, um, but it's good to just kind of um, look at these options and of course also speak with your mobile carrier to find out what your international plan options are as well. Now Japan is an incredibly safe destination and if you use your common sense when moving through the country you shouldn't have any trouble but if you do find that you've for example lost something or maybe become lost yourself then you can um, approach any one of these Koban stations uh, throughout the country and they'll be able to assist you as best they can. Now for accommodations, you have quite a few options available to you, including the Western style hotel brands that we know and love. Um, as well, you have a lot of unique options such as uh, staying in a ryokan or a traditional Japanese inn. Um, you can also try a minshuku or B&B equivalent type of an accommodation. And if you'd like to get um, very adventurous with it, you can also try a shukubo or a temple stay. Um, and this is uh, exactly as it uh, sounds. You're actually staying in a Buddhist temple, um, which give you the opportunity to do some of those hands-on experiences that um, I suggested earlier, such as uh, Zen meditation exercises, copying sutras, um, getting to see firsthand some of the Buddhist rituals, and of course eating uh, shojin jordi. So if you get the opportunity, it's a very special experience and I highly recommend it. Now for money, you have a few options available, including um, ordering currency ahead of time from your local US bank. Um, we do recommend uh, giving them 48 uh, 24 to 48 hours notice, uh, as most banks don't stock large amounts of Japanese yen on hand. Um, but you can also take your US dollars into the country and exchange them in the arrivals terminal of any international airport. Um, the exchange service desks are available there um, when you come out of the arrivals terminal, making it that much easier. And Japan is still mainly a cash-based society, so we do recommend having a good amount of Japanese yen on hand when um, making purchases, especially at, at places like mom-and-pop restaurants or um, smaller shops. Um, but if you do find that you've run out of your uh, cash reserves, you can uh, use your international bank card at any of the uh, 7-Eleven bank ATMs or post office ATMs, which are uh, located throughout the country. Um, and as remember that uh, as always, remember that there is no uh, tipping culture in Japan. So if you do, uh, for example, tip your waiter, um, you may find them chasing you down with your forgotten change. Uh, for shopping, again, you have a lot of options from department stores to 100 yen shops um, or equivalent to a 99 cent store uh, to really unique options such as temple flea markets um, and one of many handmade craft shops throughout the country that are selling uh, regional and specialized goods. Um, and anywhere that you see the Japan tax-free shopping logo in over 35,000 retail shops nationwide, you can make purchases of over 5,000 yen or more um, free of tax and you just present your passport to the shop attendant at your time of purchase and they'll fill out all of the necessary customs paperwork for you making it that much easier for you when you come back into your home country. Now of course we have to talk about Japanese cuisine when we're talking about Japan um, and washoku or Japanese cuisine has actually been registered as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage and it may surprise some to learn that Tokyo actually retains the highest number of Michelin star restaurants in the world. 
um, which <laughs> is uh, surprising, but uh, wonderful. And you don't even have to uh, spend a great deal to get a Michelin star meal in Japan. Um, you can even find a Michelin star bowl of ramen in Tokyo for around uh, eight to ten dollars a bowl. But you don't have to even eat a Michelin star meal to have an incredible dining experience in Japan. I always recommend people to kind of venture off the beaten path, get a little bit lost, and they might find something incredible. Now, cherry blossom season is by far the most popular season to visit, um, but it may surprise them to know that the cherry blossoms actually bloom south to north. So you're not limited to that last week of March, first week of April um, sort of timing that you get for more central Japan in that Tokyo and Kyoto uh, area. Um, they bl start blooming as early as late January in Okinawa, and they bloom as late as early May in Hokkaido, um, which also coincides with the end of the ski season. So um, kind of give an interesting idea of how you could ski in the morning and see cherry blossoms in the afternoon. Now, Japan has all four seasons felt very distinctly. And uh, the most common question that I get is, which is the best season to visit uh, Japan? And the answer is actually that there is no best season um, because every season has something to offer, whether you're going in the springtime for the beautiful flowers and bloom um, to the summertime with their uh, very wonderful summer festivals, fireworks displays, um, lots of street food and dancing. It's very sort of celebrational atmosphere. Um, on into the autumn where you have uh, the season of food, um, lots of uh, woodsy mushrooms and fish come into season during this time, um, as well you have the beautiful autumn foliage, those um, changing of the color of the leaves. And then of course winter time where you have uh, great winter sports, um, uh, Japao or <laughs> uh, Japanese powder snow has become very popular in recent years with uh, skiers and snowboarders. Um, so this is a great season for them. Um, and also it's a great time to enjoy those mineral hot springs that you can find throughout the country. Now, uh, for first timers to Japan, we usually recommend what we call the golden route. This is a great snapshot of the country where you get a little bit of city, a little bit of nature, um, some great uh, traditional and historical sites, and then of course, um, some great foodie destinations. You would start off in Tokyo. Um, this of course is your connection to uh, pop culture, technology, dining, shopping, um, but even in, uh, very bustling metropolis such as Tokyo, you can still find places where you can see old Japan, like um, Asakusa area um, with Sensoji Temple, um, and lots of parks and gardens like Koishikawa Korakuen Garden. Um, so it, you can still get kind of that quiet respite from the hustle and bustle. On, on from there, um, and this is all connected by bullet train um, as well, but um, on from there, you move into the Hakone Mount Fuji area. This is a great place to experience nature. You can take a, a ride aboard the Oakudani ropeway over those volcanic vents, um, see beautiful views of Mount Fuji, um, especially from uh, the ships that you can board over Lake Ashi, and uh, you can hop aboard the Hakone Tozan Railway to get more scenic views um, in that area. And this is also the place where we recommend a stay over in a traditional Japanese inn or ryokan, uh, and this is where you can experience those beautiful mineral hot springs as well. From there, we move on to um, Japan's old agent capital of Kyoto, uh, which we've talked quite a bit about. But um, as I mentioned, you have uh, 17 UNESCO World Heritage Sites to choose from here, um, as well as plenty of temples and shrines that you can visit, um, lots of art museums, um, beautiful historical districts, and you can also see um, some beautiful nature as well. If you find yourself there during the summer, you can also try something called Kaladoko River Dining. And this is when they erect platforms out over the rivers, um, which allows the water to pass underneath, cooling the air around you, um, which makes for a much more enjoyable dining experience during those hot summer months. From there, we move on to Osaka. This is a great foodie destination. This is the bustling Dotonbori area um, where you can uh, see over 2,000 uh, bars and restaurants, um, and you can try lots of different types of uh, great bee gourmet or street foods. Um, some of my favorites include kushikatsu, um, which is just breaded uh, meat and vegetables um, that are fried, and it pairs excellently with beer. Um, other dishes include takoyaki, okonomiyaki, etc. 
Uh, and you can also still find um, remnants of old Japan with visits to places like Osaka Castle. And then if you're looking for a great 360 degree view of Osaka, you can visit the Umeda Sky Building um, with their beautiful obser um, observation deck up at the top. Now a great, um, which we'll cover <laughs> this destination extensively in our next um, video in this series, but uh, Nara is a great um, day trip or um, overnight option from either Kyoto or Osaka. They're both uh, pretty equidistant from Nara. Um, and this is where you can see a further eight UNESCO World Heritage sites located um, in and around Nara Park, um, where most of the things you're gonna wanna see are pretty centrally located, um, places such as Todaiji Temple, um, but what people really get excited about is the um, over 1,000 wild deer that wander around the park. Um, and actually, if you bow to the deer, uh, they will bow back to you. But just make sure that you have some of their deer crackers on hand as they can get quite cranky when you don't feed them. <laughs> Now, moving on from there, if you have uh, 14 or more days to uh, dedicate to your itinerary, you can seamlessly incorporate Hiroshima as well. Um, and again, a lot of what you're going to want to see is pretty centrally located around Hiroshima Station. Um, and they do have a wonderful hop on, hop off bus called the Meipuru. And if you're a Japan Rail Pass holder, this bus um, is used, um, is available for use free of charge. For you, and it hits a lot of the highlight destinations such as Shukane Garden, Peace Memorial Park, uh, the Hiroshima Prefectural Art Museum, and more. And you can also use that Japan Rail Pass to hop aboard the ferry to take you across um, the Seto Inland Sea to nearby uh, Miyajima Island, where you can see the beautiful Itsukushima Shrine, um, and there are also wild deer that uh, populate this island as well. So that's a lot of information packed into a short amount of time, but uh, we're here to help you with all of your questions. We have two offices in the U.S. to serve you, one in Los Angeles and one in New York. Um, we are mostly working from home these days, so email is the best way to reach us. Um, but please do let us know if you have any questions um, and we'll be happy to assist you. So thank you so much. And I think we'll start the Q&A now. <laughs> Yeah, we'll start the question and answer. So I'm gonna go back and share my screen and uh, we'll get to some questions. There are some very good ones that I saw. So hopefully this will go, yeah. So some of the questions that I saw, one of the questions is from Rick Pinson and Rick Pinson asks, how is it determined when or how often a hibutsu is revealed or not? And Rick, that's a very good question. Um, that is something that can be uh, steeped in the tradition of the um, temple. It can be something that is just following temple tradition for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. It may have been something that was established by clergy a long time ago, or it could be something that up into the present day, they decide that, oh, um, you know, we decide like we will open this uh, sculpture and this hibutsu will reveal it to the public. and. It's often uh, a very, very careful, very deliberate, and very well-researched decision, I think, made by the clergy of this temple. Um, Sophie Harris asks, uh, what are the sculptures usually made of? Does it vary depending on who is depicted? Does the material have a meaning to it? So lots of very good questions there. So the sculptures are usually made of wood. Uh, Earlier on in the history, they would have been made of bronze um, or they would have been made of stone. But very quickly, wood became the preferred material of choice because of its ease of use. Um, and you can create uh, very, very deep, beautiful, dynamic lines in wood um, with less effort than it would take um, to do so in stone. Uh, does it vary depending on who is depicted? No. Uh, so material isn't so much a thing that is, it, it doesn't so much follow the deity that is depicted, it more follows the importance of what's going on. There are certain woods that are used for more auspicious figures and there are certain woods that are used for more, uh, you know, common figures, uh, kind of the lower figures like the celestial beings. Um, but that is, in the most case, no, there's usually, um, 
you would see things like sandalwood, you would see things like cypress, you would see things like zalkova or paulonia. These are all woods that are commonly used to make sculptures, and these are all aromatic woods, um, and you can smell them when you enter the space if, uh, not always, but there is a fragrance uh, when you can see some of these sculptures. Um, does the material have a meaning to it? Um, they're a fragrant wood. They are more expensive woods usually. Um, these are woods that would have been uh, purchased by aristocracy, um, by nobility, by the imperial house. And so they would have been a lot more expensive to be able to access. Uh, so there's no real meaning to the material so much that it represents the money that went into creating these sculptures. Uh, Kate, you ask if the statues in the Sanmon are visible to the public. Um, as of my checking right now, no, but that might change in the future. And so I would recommend that you keep an eye on any announcements from Chioni. Uh, Paul, can you comment on the possible connections among the Buddhist artisans over the centuries? How were they associated with the temples? Were they monks or commissioned artisans, schools of Buddhist artisans, etc.? So, uh, I can, there's a huge answer to this, um, but I can very, very briefly answer this, is that there are often ateliers that are dedicated to creating Buddhist sculpture. And the most famous ones in, Japan, in Japanese history, I would say, are the K school, the In school, and the N school. Um, and these were all... Um, they all sort of stemmed out of Jocho, who we saw with the Byodoin. They sort of proceed out of Jocho's sculpting technique. And what he created and through the, um, through the disciples or the um, students that he trained, that's how this K school, that's how this N school, and this is how the In school were all formed. And so they are often hired or commissioned by an emperor, by an aristocratic member, by a court member, or even by a very wealthy family. They are commissioned to create these objects that are then installed at temples. Um, Rosa Kawahira, you ask, are deities representations of real people or are they all mythical images? Is there any relationship between Kukai and Honen? So for your first answer, Deities, um, they are representations of both real people and mythical images. Um, so you would have the founder's images. So what we saw with Honen, um, what we saw with uh, Zendo, uh, what we saw with Enchin, and uh, these are all representations of real people, people that actually existed. There are some really cool sculptures. Uh, so for example, at Horyuji or Todaiji, you can see these portrait sculptures that actually look like real people. And the use of crystal, crystal eyes in them add this sense, this glitter of life. And it's really cool to see. Um, and then the wood that they use, they carve it so that you can see the creases in the skin in their face. And it's just such a cool result. Um, and then is there any relationship between Kukai and Honen? Um, they are both founders, but they are founders of different schools of Buddhism. Kukai is the founder of Shingon Esoteric Buddhism, and Honen, who came a few centuries after Kukai, is the founder of Pure Land Buddhism in Japan. Uh, so at Kiyomi Tudera, there is a section of the temple you have to traverse in the dark to see an item hidden below. What is that? That I don't know. Um, the last time I was at Kiyomi Tudera was when I was, uh, it was 2011, it was almost 10 years ago, was the last time that uh, I was in Kyoto. And uh, I don't remember that. So maybe that's something new, or maybe I'll have to do some research. So send me an email after this presentation is done, and uh, I would be very, very happy to try and do a little bit more research for that. Um, I have heard of a temple featuring a moss garden. Info worth a visit. That might be something for UK. This is Saihoji. So yeah. uh, it's also known as Kokedera for the moss temple. 
Um, Sai Hoji does require a reservation to visit. Um, I did see that there was another question um, pertaining to um, whether they need reservations in order to visit. Um, Sai Hoji is one such temple that does require a reservation um, as the monks work actively to uh, preserve um, the temple, specifically because uh, the moss is so precious. So um, they don't allow a whole lot of visitors per day. Um, it used to be that you would have to apply by mail. Um, unfortunately, the USPS um, stopped a service that allowed for the prepaid return postage um, back to Japan, um, which has kind of made that reserving process um, impossible now. Um, a lot of people will also utilize um, tour operators or um, travel agencies in order to um, make those reservations um, as there are a lot of agencies that exist both in, the, in Japan and in the US. And so they have the ability to do the uh, reserve by mail um, in Japan. Um, but uh, you do also have the option of um, showing up to see if there are any um, cancellations or no-shows um, and then they may allow you in as well. Um, it just kind of depends on how I think how they're feeling that day um, and also the, the cancellations or, or um, uh, no-shows that may have occurred um, for a given reservation. But yes, that's Sai Hoji. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we're going to call it at that. There um, was another question oh, was about, yes. Um, it was from anonymous attendee. If one has been vaccinated, will testing still be necessary? Um, and the short answer to that is for a number of reasons, yes. Um, testing will still be necessary, um, both for, you know, verification purposes and also um, that being the standard policy to uh, test for active infection um, and uh, for safety purposes, uh, the quarantine is still necessary as well. So regardless, um, quarantine will be necessary until that restriction is lifted. Um, but uh, for the quarantine specifically, it uh, limits the ability to use public transit. So that's um, for the, the safety of the public. So you'd be quarantining um, either if you have friends or family that are in Japan that are able to pick you up um, from the airport, you can quarantine um, with them at home or um, you can quarantine at, at a place designated by um, the officials there at the airport. Great. So, I think we will conclude that there. Thank you everybody for joining us. It was so exciting having this opportunity to present Kyoto to you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, um, thank you very much, uh, Michael and Kaysen, uh, for the very uh, interesting and informative presentation. Um, I have a few announcements to make. Um, so the, um, yeah, um, the polls, uh, uh, just a, so please um, answer the survey. Please click the poll button in the bottom and there's a quick survey, so please answer that so we can prepare for another great event. And also, there will be, there will be another um, presentation by Mike Wilson and Kaysen, um on the February 25th. So if you haven't signed up for that, uh, please go ahead. Um, please go to the, our website for the register. So um, I guess um, that's it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much all for coming tonight. Um, have a great night. Thank you.